Hello and welcome to Valley Viewpoint. Today, we are going to be discussing a disaster that has taken place in southeastern Washington and just across the border in Oregon. My guests are Liz Jesse, who is the director for the Walla Walla County Emergency Management, Todd Kimball, a county commissioner, and Dixie Ferguson, who directed the shelter management for the American Red Cross. So welcome. Yeah. So what took place? We had a flood. Yes. Who can give us the details on the flood and why it happened, how it happened? Well, I can, I can give some of that. Um, you know, rain started on Thursday uh, up in the mountains and it was a significant amount of rain, more rain than was expected. Um, we had some minor flood warnings, but uh, nothing to the magnitude that we had. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, uh, flows down Mill Creek went from about 3,400 to about 4,200, which, which makes it up to the flood stage. Um, Bennington Lake was diverting a significant amount of water excuse me, the core was, was diverting a significant amount of water into Bennington Lake uh, so that the water didn't flow down through the middle of town. Uh, they kept that at 3,900 CFS, which is cubic feet per second. Uh, they got up to, at about six or seven in the morning, about 2,500 CFS flowing into Bennington Lake, and they still kept the, the water going down through town at 3,900 to keep the, uh, the town of Walla Walla safe from flooding. Uh, Bennington Lake got up to about 80, 85 percent full uh, at 8 p.m. that night. So a uh, couple more hours of flooding and it would have, a couple more hours of that rain, uh, downtown Walla Walla would no longer have been safe. Um, it, was a, it was a disaster on many levels, uh, property loss. Um, we were lucky to have no one, uh, no one lose their life. Um, we were very lucky in that regard. So how about Mill Creek itself? and the community referred to as Kuskuski. Uh, Kuskuski took a beating. Uh, we were up there at two in the morning and we got the call about 1.40. Uh, we headed up there to look at the damage that was beginning because that's when the water was at 4,200. Um, by about four or five in the morning, it was 7,000 CFS, so it rose very quickly. Uh, and Kuskuski, there were a lot of uh, houses, not underwater, but their, their decks and everything were, uh, were totally engulfed in water. and. Uh, the damage around it was, was amazing. Uh, trees falling into the river and they literally, the whole 80 foot trees would fall into the river and just disappear. The water would, was flowing that fast and that deep. Now, I know it's still early in the process, but what can you tell us about the assessments and what kind of damage we're looking at? Well, county, uh, county infrastructure, uh, bridges, roads, we're looking at 8 to 15 million are kind of the numbers that we're uh, getting thrown around. Um, we don't have a final number yet. We have to have it by Friday, well, according to this show, last Friday at noon uh, to send to the governor to see if we can get a disaster declaration. So the 15 million is just talking about infrastructure. It's not talking about the individual property losses of the people who were most affected by this flood, correct? That is correct. We're talking roads, bridges, things like that. So 15 million there, plus all the damage to the homes. Correct. No. Now, Liz, what is your role in responding to these types of emergencies? Well, um, first of all, I am in close contact with the Corps of Engineers um, throughout flood season, and there's certain set criteria, and at certain levels in the Mill Creek Channel, they alert me. And so I, I got the phone call at about 1.20 in the morning on Thursday morning and notified my commissioners uh, of the event. And then my role is uh, to get out public information, to activate our uh, emergency alert system if necessary, which, which we ended up that we did evacuate residents up Mill Creek Road um, up to the border and uh, we used our emergency notification system for that and assist with resources as needed. So what kind of resources are available? Well, we have uh, sandbag, uh, um, sandbags that we keep in storage for an event like this, and so those were deployed. Um, and then uh, we were also working closely with the incident command post and getting apprised of the situation up there. Um, if there were 
uh, phone calls we were receiving from concerned family members as the event progressed. There were some people who were evacuated that their family members couldn't locate them and I worked closely with the Red Cross to see if those individuals were at the Red Cross. So who is responsible when a disaster like this happens to get the people out? They generally self-evacuate, but there were instances in this event where the fire department went in and, and got people, and it was there was mutual aid. There was a lot of different fire districts that were at the incident command post, which was at the Mill Creek Fire Station up on Mill Creek Road, and that was a fire district four fire station, but there were fire districts from all over that responded. In particular, Fire District 8 has a big, what they call a six by six vehicle that can travel through 48 inches of water, and it was used extensively to, to rescue people out of their homes. Now, Dixie, you manage the Red Cross shelter. Mm -hmm. I know that some of the people <coughs> who were evacuated had other relatives in the area who are on dry ground. They could go and spend uh, the time with them. Some people are not so lucky. What service does the Red Cross provide for these individuals who need a place to go? Right. The minute we get the word from emergency management, Liz, she makes the phone call, and uh, we, we go right in uh, to our mobility emergency needs. So we uh, open the shelter, and in this case, it was the fairgrounds, and it was a very logical situation because of horses, animals needing uh, stalls and uh, so what we do we shelter and we feed and we attend to the physical emotional and mental needs of the people who uh, don't have any resources so people in one of the affected areas had horses and perhaps other animals that needed to be sheltered so the fairgrounds was chosen mm -hmm. tell me about the whole system of providing shelter how do you identify what structures are available for shelters and suitable to meet the needs of these people? Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the year, uh, we have someone that goes around. We obtain memorandums of understanding. There has to be certain conditions met. Uh, that would be uh, showers, uh, adequate space, um, <clears throat> feeding area, hopefully kitchen, uh, parking, uh, those types of, uh, obviously enough room for uh, Red Cross staffing area, and uh, we set up our cots. So we have different parts of the shelter. So uh, those things we want to be in place. Uh, when, so that's when we're, when we're opening up, we want those to be right there, ready to go. So what is the maximum, maximum number of persons that you could have accommodated at the shelter which you established in Walla Walla at the fairgrounds? Well, I would say 300. I think that would have been about the maximum. If it had been the YMCA, they could accommodate over 1,000. So, oh. but uh-huh, which is uh, quite significant. But uh, yes, uh, for, for the purposes, uh, about 300. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the YMCA is another one that you have a memorandum of understanding that with, is, is that correct? Uh -huh, how correct. many shelters or how many potential shelters are there in the county? Oh my, <clears throat> uh, we would have, and this is off of the top of my head, about 10 or 15. These would be churches, Sunbridge. Uh, we even have the Washington State Penitentiary as our feeding source. So, uh, but mostly, uh, yeah, schools, churches. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you decide which one to use? Well, in this particular case, because of the need, obviously for the animals, it was mm -hmm. just very logical for the, for the fairgrounds. Now, I can go back a couple of years ago uh, when we had the uh, firestorm. <laughs> I got the call from Liz and, oh my goodness, the Mormon church, its roof, the sun bridge was damaged, and we just basically had nowhere to go. It, it was really a very unusual situation. Uh, but uh, it, it's the type of disaster that we have. Now I can go back to Blue Creek, and uh, we opened the other part of the fairgrounds for that, and no one showed for that. So they're all a little bit different, so we try to meet 
the need accordingly to the disaster, the type of disaster. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Kimball, we've talked about the financial aspects of this. $15 million perhaps for infrastructure, uh, roads, bridges collapsing, et cetera. But how about the human element? Uh, what can you tell us about how many persons have been displaced by this disaster? Well, um, in, in, in this county alone, not <coughs> speaking about surrounding areas like Pendleton and Milton Freewater, but in Walla Walla County. It would be a total guess on my part. Um, maybe Liz might have a better number, but um, um, that evening from the fire station up, there was a mandatory evacuation. I would estimate 100 to 150 people were, were evacuated that night. Just in that one area? In that one area, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Waitsburg obviously had some, some areas that they had to evacuate as well. I would. I Which would, is also in Walla Walla County. Correct, yes. They're an incorporated city, but yes, they are in Walla Walla County, so they're under our purview as commissioners. So a um, total of 200 people probably, 250 mm -hmm. maybe, so were evacuated actually, mandatory evacuations. Okay. Now, Liz, we have all of these people who have to leave their homes. Uh, some of them have relatives where they can live for a time. Uh, some of them found their way to a shelter. But the long term, what happens with these people? Well, we again work closely with the Red Cross and the Red Cross operated a multi-agency resource center uh, the week following the event. Um, various organizations were invited there, Blue Mountain Action Council, um, some other organizations, and then the Red Cross sat down with people and did some case management and looked for ways that they could help people that were uh, permanently without housing. Um, unfortunately, there's not a very large inventory of available rentals uh, through through BMAC, um, so I'm sure that there was some very some very creative things that were done. <laughs> we're very blessed that a lot of people came forward and volunteered to pay, take in strangers, um, that they had an extra room, and we saw that happening uh, during the event. So um, through the kindness of strangers and friends and relatives, um, by the time we shut the shelter, there was no one that had a need of a place to stay. Could I add just a little bit to Certainly. that? Certainly. <clears throat> I wish I had the multiple sheets of total strangers that came through the Red Cross shelter. Uh, housing, food, kennels, dog care, um, it, it truly was an amazing thing. And I see that after each disaster, but Walla Walla is really special. Mm -hmm. And as Liz said, by the time the shelter had closed, uh, we felt comfortable that everybody, not not ideally, no. but they but they had a roof over their head and a place to stay, and they felt safe. Great. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a little break right now. When we come back, we want to talk more about the long-term recovery, uh, what resources people should have access to, what they can do to rebuild their lives. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to Valley Viewpoint. If you are just joining us, my guests are talking about a flood that came through Walla Walla County and surrounding areas in recent days. What's happening and what can be done, perhaps you can be a part of it. Okay, so Liz, we were talking in the last segment about the fact that, you know, hundreds of people potentially have been displaced. Uh, it's a flood. So their homes are probably filled with mud. Yeah. It's probably drywall that is soaked and ruined. Is there any help for these people? Absolutely. Uh, we're working with the Washington Conservation Corps. We, early in the incident, called them to help us manage all the um, volunteers that were, were coming and wanting to help. And uh, we had our hands full doing a lot of things. And so we asked them to coordinate our volunteers for us. Uh, they work in a system called Crisis Cleanup and set up an 800 number where people can call and then an agency will go in and select that property owner and go and do work at their property. Mind you, it's not work to restore it to its previous condition, but it's to make it as healthy as possible. 
So they will take out wet sheetrock and they call it mud out. They will remove the mud from the home. And we even have an organization, uh, Southern Baptist Disaster Aid Group, that has a spray that they will go in and apply um, to the property on the inside to prevent mold. Now, when we go into an area that's been flooded, there's always the question about electrical safety. Uh, how is that handled? Who makes sure that the power is off so that people don't get electrocuted? Is that who? Well, I know Pacific Power has been up there a lot, and uh, I know they've been doing a lot of repairs, and, and they're the ones that would, would mm -hmm. control the power uh, mm -hmm. when it's on, when it's off. Um, I think people pretty much know when their power's on because really up Mill Creek, very little power was lost. Uh, there was a power line or two that went down, but for the most part, uh, power stayed on for most of the people up there. Now, we've already talked about the debris. Large trees just tumbling and, and floating downstream. Uh, so you get one of these things in your yard <laughs> that was from the neighbor two miles upstream. Uh, or part of their, I don't know, dog kennel or chicken coop or whatever ends up down in your yard or their fence comes down. Uh, this is a lot of weight. How do you get all that stuff out of there? Well, there's actually two things we've done. One, the county has provided dumpsters up on Mill Creek for people to get rid of garbage, uh, uh, treated wood, stuff like that, and stuff from their house that's no longer usable. Um, there's actually dumpsters up there. They're getting dumped every day. They're getting emptied and they're full every day from people cleaning up their property. The trees themselves, uh, the county got a special flood uh, burn permit for all residents uh, in certain zones, and I don't have the phone number with me, but um, get on the Walla Walla County website. Uh, there is a burn permit available for everyone to use. Um, there are limits to the size of the burn. You wouldn't want someone putting up a big bonfire that's 20 feet tall, but um, hmm. you know, 10 feet wide by four feet tall, you're allowed to burn natural vegetation that's caused by the flood. So that person's tree that came down the river that stopped into your property, you are able to burn that safely. Okay, Dixie, uh, I know that you were in part uh, responsible for organizing the MARC. Uh, first explain to our audience what the MARC, the acronym stands for, and what takes place. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-agency resource center. <laughs> uh, and as Liz referred to earlier, uh, you've got uh, Helpline, BMAC, uh, you had the uh, 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 agricultural service there, uh, there was, in fact, WorkSource. There was the Veterans Counseling Center there. Uh, a multiple a number of agencies. Uh, the county commissioner uh, was there. And, uh, of course, the Red Cross. So we managed it. Uh, we did have a meeting with these different agencies beforehand and, and set a plan. And so I contacted each one of them. And they were there from Friday through Sunday from uh, 10 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. We closed this last uh, Sunday. I think that was the 16th. And we had a steady stream of people coming through. And uh, it, was, it was a very beneficial one-stop shopping for people coming through. Now, Liz mentioned earlier that you have caseworkers. Mm -hmm. What does a caseworker do? Right. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> we have damage assessment teams that go out. They don't go on the property. It's kind of like a drive-by to the affected areas. They take the notes. Those are input into the computer. The caseworkers follow up with that, and then uh, we advertise that they can come in to the uh, shelter and uh, <clears throat> meet with the caseworker there. And uh, it has to be major or destroyed property before we will give them financial, Red Cross of financial assistance. Uh, it's, it's not a huge amount, but it's a good faith effort in their recovery. And then we also have caseworkers that do go out into the field and literally knock on doors asking how we can help them. Mm -hmm. Now in every human situation, there's always someone looking to take advantage. So, question is, uh, when we're offering 
these various services and resources and financial assistance and so forth. How do you assure that this is going to the people who really need it, not somebody who says, oh, they're giving away something and I just think I'll go and <laughs> get my little piece of the pie, even if they weren't affected? Well, <clears throat> you know what? Most people are very fair and very honest. The common comment is, no, no, I don't need this as much as someone else needs it. That's very common. It really brings out the good in people. And those, and we were just bombarded with wonderful, oh my gosh, uh, dog food, uh, f uh, hygiene items. One man had collected all kinds of coupons. He had redeemed them. We had a half a table full of hygiene <laughs> items from his <laughs> redeemed coupons. That's just the spirit of the whole thing. And uh, uh, hygiene kits, mop, by the way, we do send out uh, cleanup kits when they go out for the assessment. Uh, so that helps a lot. But anyway, when people are coming through the door, it's just an honor system and it really does work. Great. Yeah. Now, Liz, what does a county do to prepare for the inevitable, uh, for the disasters that, that are going to come? I mean, I understand we could have an earthquake here sometime. So, uh, what is the planning process? Well, we are required to have certain plans in place, and um, among those is a comprehensive emergency management plan, uh, hazard mitigation plan. Uh, community wildfire protection plan. We have a lot of plans that we have to keep up to date and they're important to be that they're maintained uh, so that we can get reimbursement in the event of a disaster. So we do that planning piece and then we also go out into the community and do uh, preparedness presentations. Upcoming in March for example we'll be at the Walla Walla Police uh, Department's uh, Citizens Academy and we give an overview of emergency management and what our hazards are and what things you can do to prepare and you know we cover having a preparedness kit and what to do if there's an earthquake how to drop cover and hold on all kinds of things we try and encourage the community that if they live in a flood zone that they should have flood insurance that's one of our our things that we recommend in our presentation uh, unfortunately in this event there are several people that we're without flood insurance for this event. What motivates you uh, to become involved in mm -hmm. preparing, uh, helping mm -hmm. people to get through these types of situations? Well, for, for me personally, I, I very well understand the, the potential for an earthquake and the other kinds of things that can happen and we try and relate that to the public as, as we get more and more information all the time. Uh, we had an earthquake road show uh, last fall and we're planning to do another one this spring and it talks about the geological hazards and, and what could p potentially happen and uh, just communicating that message, you know, we're not the cheeriest people to be around, we emergency <laughs> managers, it's kind of, you know, I'm not great at a dinner party. Um, I'm the person that's talking about Cascadia subduction zone and, and all kinds of different hazards. And uh, so, so just getting people informed of the potential for something to happen. And then the next question is always, well, if that happens, what can I do to prepare for it? Todd, you're a public servant. Why? What <laughs> motivates you to serve your community in, in times of disaster and throughout the year? Well, you know, I, I uh, giving back is always the easy answer, but you know, I, uh, I was born and raised in Walla Walla, farm family for many generations, and I, I feel the need that there needs to be a farmer on the commission, and that's, that's really the reason I started this process. Uh, the farmer that was on as a county commissioner was retiring and I just thought it was that important that we had a, a farmer on the commission. The majority of our revenue in this county comes from, from from ag products of some sort and that's what started me and uh, you know it's people like Liz that, that, uh, that make my job easier. Um, mm -hmm. Hiring Liz to handle this emergency uh, has, been, has been a godsend for us. Uh, we're lucky to have her, she's done a great job. and. Uh, with the help of the Red Cross and many others, uh, we've gotten through this to this point. We obviously have a lot of cleanup to do, but uh, but I'm looking forward to that. So, 
And Dixie, the same question. It's an easy answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am so proud of this little pin right here. It's 50 years with the Red Cross. Wow. And you're only 29. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I gave this away on television. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I have had the most incredible life's experiences working with fellow Red Cross people, both staff and volunteers. It's a giving organization. The wonderful people that you meet in the community, uh, the inspiration, people, the, the spirit of the people. I've been out on a number of disasters and I can say almost all of them. There's, for the most part, they're so calm that, you know, I've got my family, I've got my life, I've got, you know, I've got my health. I, I'm so grateful. And you're always amazed at the spirit. I want to say you're all amazing. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. all that you have done. I want to thank you for joining us on Viewpoint. And if you have an idea for a future program, contact me at valleyviewpoint at bmt.tv. For Viewpoint, I'm Dan Solis.